Aurelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. Dave is a chiropractor by profession, a record-breaking master swimmer, and an avid local historian. He has penned 22 books about the history of our area, his books are an important record of our sports and cultural history. This will be Dave's eighth presentation as a guest speaker for OMA, having forged a reputation as an engaging speaker for diverse groups in and around Aurelia. His latest book is Aurelia Spirit is Born, and that's the subject of his talk tonight. He will recount the Aurelia spirit that defined our community between 1880 and 1920. And we thank him for kickstarting the OMA History Speakers series again this year. So over to you, Dave. I'm taking you back to the first week of July in 1884. That week, um, Peter Bertram from Aurelia and Henry Scadding from Aurelia uh, hopped on the train and went down to Toronto to um, experience Toronto's semi-centennial celebration. It had been 50 years since uh, Toronto incorporated as a city. That's when it changed from the town of York to the town of Toronto. Um, they put on uh, five days of, of events. There was a parade every day. There were sporting events. Um, there were concerts. Uh, there were uh, I I any number of receptions and galas. They commissioned a 600-page history of Toronto. They even minted a coin, a, a commemorative coin for the, for the semi-centennial of Toronto. Well, Peter Bertram and Henry Scadding were really impressed. And by the end of, by the, end of the five days, they decided that maybe Aurelia could do something like that. I mean, why not Aurelia? Which was the, the typical attitude in, in town at that time. But they had to wonder, what, well, what are we gonna celebrate? A semi-centennial, what, what happened 50 years ago for Aurelia? Well, it had been about 50 years since the first um, pioneers had arrived uh, in this, this part of the, uh, the county of North of, North of Barrie. The white settlers, um, they were they were coming from uh, all parts of Great Britain. They arrived. It was a tremendous hardship. They had to they had to clear the forests. They didn't know what kind of land they were going to get. They had to build shanties to live in, all with a Canadian winter that they'd never experienced before. Um, a lot of a lot of the pioneers gave up and and moved on. They had their land was too poor or they weren't up to the task and they moved on. But uh, a lot of them persevered. Um, I want to give you one example of a family that persevered that. I, I didn't know the story till I came across it researching this book, but it's uh, it's uh, really impressed me. It's the it's the story of the Tudhope family. If you're if you're from Aurelia, you'll recognize the name of the Tudhopes. In 1831, 51 year old James Tudhope brought his 20 year old eldest son with him, and they took a land grant in Jarrett. Um, if I, of course, now I can't change my my slideshow. There, <laughs> don't know how I did that. Um, in Jarrett, right in the center of the picture. Um, they cleared their land, they, they built a small, uh, a small shanty, they got a farm started, and the next year, and they decided they were set up well enough that uh, James could call his wife Christian over from England. So Christian and the other eight children um, got on board ship and, and headed over to, uh, to Canada. One month before they arrived, uh, James, the father, died of sunstroke out in his field, leaving poor George at 20 years old, or I guess 21 years old at that point, all alone on the farm with his mother and eight siblings coming. So he got on the train. He traveled all the way to Quebec City. He met his mother, broke the terrible news to him. And she was devastated. But they continued on, and he brought his mother and his siblings to, uh, to Jarrett, and uh, they continued the farm. Christian, the mother, who was only 39 years old, was devastated, went into complete de depression. And four months later at Christmas time, she died of what they said was a broken heart. 
leaving poor George at 21 years old with his eight siblings, the youngest being two and a half years old, the next one four years old. Um, and he had to care for them. The nearest neighbor was four kilometers away. And it's he must have been a remarkable guy because he was successful. He The, the farm thrived. Um, he got his younger sisters married off to very prominent families. His younger brothers, he found them all professions. And the significant one was that two and a half year old. When he grew up, uh, none of them had much schooling, but uh, he sent young William off to Barry to apprentice with a blacksmith. And when he had finished that apprenticeship, uh, William as a young man set up a blacksmithy in Jarrett, then he moved to Aurelia. And when Aurelia boomed after the railways arrived, his business boomed with them. So that by 1877, he was wealthy enough that he could build a huge three three story factory to build wagons. So he, young William Tidehope's life mirrored Aurelia's where it was a community that struggled until the railways arrived. And then the economy just just boomed in the area. We're going to we're going to come back to William Tidehope in a little while. But by 1884, the year of the semi-centennial, um, Aurelia was a thriving town. The railways brought uh, civilization to town um, and, and uh, the economy was booming. Um, Aurelia was full of factories. There were probably uh, 40 or 50 factories, some large, some small. Um, there was a, a, a thriving uh, mercantile business up and down the main street because Aurelia was the supply center, not only for North Simcoe County, but for Muskoka as well. So the, the merchants um, who, who hit on the right business plan um, made a lot of money, and those businessmen were savvy enough to reinvest their money in themselves. And they, they uh, expanded their businesses, they started new lines, the factories grew, um, the, mer the merchants on the main street uh, were supplying um, lumber camps as far north as Sault Ste. Marie. Um, so Aurelia was, a, was a, a, a very, thriving town, and it was filled with men with big ideas. They, at, in 1884, when Peter Bertram and Henry Scadding came back from Toronto City Centennial, Aurelia as a town was ready to celebrate its success. And uh, they latched on to the idea of having a semi-centennial celebration of the pioneers. And it's interesting, the mayor at that time was George Booth, who himself was one of those early pioneers. Um, he was born in 1836, I think, um, in Aurelia on one of those pioneer farms. Um, he had gone into the furniture business, and by 1884, in his late 50s, he was now described in the census as a man of leisure. Um, he had been successful enough. So lots of support for this idea of having a semi-centennial. Let's celebrate the pioneers. Um, they had three months. They chose the date of October 2nd, 1884, as the day of the celebration. Um, and on that day, they planned four big events. Uh, first up was the lacrosse game at 9 a.m. They invited uh, Cannington to bring their team up to play the Aurelia lacrosse team. Aurelia was now the champion of, of the North. They defeated every team north of Richmond Hill. And Cannington was one of their big rivals. But on this day, um, they handled Cannington with very little difficulty, three straight games. It was scheduled to be three hours long, and they, they beat them in, in one hour. So that was the, the, the start of it. Uh, Aurelia would go on to be the national champions in lacrosse in 1886, 1887, and 1889. So they were on the on the verge of that success. But after the game, the the Oval Field up where Lions Oval School is now at, at Brand and West Street. Um, once the lacrosse teams left, then it became the site of the organization for the grand parade they were scheduling. Um, there we are. The parade ground became a site of chaos as a thousand people were marching in the parade. That included 600 school children, but there were 400 people beyond the 600 school children. There were 150 horses, um, all kinds of wagons, all milling around on the agricultural grounds, getting organized for this parade. So Peter Bertram and Scatting were there trying to organize them and get them in the right places. Um, this was an unprecedented parade in the history of Aurelia. Um, they organized the parade in four parts. Um, first, it was going to be the past, 
And it started with the uh, representatives of the Chippewa Nation, then we're going to come the pioneers, and then we're going to come the present with the uh, industrialists and mercantile trader uh, um, uh, businessmen, and then it was going to be the future with the children. Starting with the Chippewa seemed like a reasonable idea, but it sure didn't pan out because by the time the parade was ready to start, the Chippewa who had arrived from Rama in full regalia, intending to march, um, were in no shape to march. They'd been standing for three hours, watching all the commotion, uh, drinking whiskey. Um, and it's rather understandable. They really weren't in um, any kind of mood to celebrate the pioneers. When you think of their history, where they gave up their land to, to take up uh, the town site of Aurelia as part of their reserve, where no white man would step foot, it only took six years for the white settlers nearby to make life so miserable for them that they asked to be removed and, and uh, transferred over to Rama. Um, there's all kinds of reasons I could go into, but uh, the, the worst of it was um, the Methodist missionaries had been helping the Chippewa uh, kick the alcohol habit that the traders had, had got them hooked on. And uh, half of the, the Chippewa were, um, um, were sober at this point. And then in 1834, the government gave their agent permission to open an inn right in the Indian village, and every inn included a tavern. And so now the government was serving uh, whiskey right in the Indian village. And that was, that was just about the last straw for them. So by the time, 50 years later, when they're having the semi-centennial celebration, there was a lot of hard feeling between the Chippewa and the white man um, that uh, they had been driven away from their land. So by the time the parade was starting on the agri agricultural grounds, only two of the Chippewa were able to stagger around the course. The rest of them were sleeping it off in the, in the uh, oval fields. But after the Chippewa um, came the pioneers. And this is, this is a, a huge success. You can see at the bottom, it says in 1836, there were 350 homesteads um, in North Simcoe County, north of Barrie. 50 years later in 1884, they rounded up 90 pioneers who were marching in this parade. You think after 50 years, how many of the original pioneers have died? There were still 90 of them who were enthusiastic enough to march in this parade is, is a pretty remarkable success story. And it turns out the pioneers were really enthusiastic about being there. They, they were um, very receptive to the acknowledgement that they were being given. There were 72 men um, marching in the parade. They were followed by 18 pioneer women in, in carriages following behind them. Now, what's, what's significant here is that this was not a pleasant day. You know, it was the 2nd of, of October. It could have been a beautiful fall day, but it was wet and drizzly. Um, it had been a heavy mist all day. It, it had been overcast for a week. And uh, by the time the parade was starting, the heavy mist was devolving into just a light drizzle. And it was just a cold, wet, miserable day. But we had these 90 pioneers still enthusiastic to march. And what's even more remarkable is that 5,000 people showed up to line the parade course to celebrate these pioneers. All morning, Trains had been arriving every half hour, unloading uh, spectators for the big parade. Um, people came from all over North Simcoe County, from, from as far away as Beaverton and Barrie. Um, a lot of them were supporting their fathers or grandfathers. Um, it, probably every pioneer had an extended family who was in the crowd. Aurelia was only uh, populated by 3,000 people. So to have 5,000 people watching the parade with 1,000 people marching in the parade, you can see how many people came from out of town to watch this in the wet, cold drizzle. There are a lot of really remarkable stories of those 90 pioneers who were marching. I just wanted to sh share a few of them. Mercy Man Waring was there. She was the first school teacher in the, the Methodist uh, school for the, the uh, Chippewa. Uh, she arrived in 1832, but uh, when they were, when the Chippewa left for Rama, she had married the other school teacher, Andrew Moffat, and they became the first people to buy up a town a town lot in the original Indian village, and became very successful opening a general store and then a, a, a pork slaughterhouse. Um, but she was uh, one of the matriarchs in Aurelia. Uh, 
Francis Godor is a fascinating character. Um, he was the son of Antoine Godor, who was a, a French uh, fur, fur trapper. Oh, there's my dog. Um, and a, a, Chippewa, a Chippewa mother. He was fluent in French and English and several uh, native languages. Um, but he had chosen to live in the white man's world, not in the, not in the native world. He was never fully accepted into the white man's world, never fully accepted into the native world for that reason. He was sort of lost in the middle. But because he had these language skills and was very intelligent and was very cheerful as how they describe him, he found lots of employment as an interpreter for business interests and government agents. Uh, and he spent uh, uh, several decades as the operator of the old iron swing bridge across the Narrows, where you would close it and let trains cross and open it and let ships go through. Um, he's probably most famous for his son, who was Jake Cador, who was the world sculling champion in 1895. Um, Josiah Henderson, you'll remember from last February's talk at OMA, um, he is a fascinating fellow. He was born in Richmond, Virginia, in the South prior to the American Civil War. He had a, a, a father who was a medical doctor, but a mother who was who was listed as colored. And so even as a 10-year-old, Josiah Henderson was known as a free man of color because he was living in the South before the Civil War. Well, um, he ended up in Orillia in 1842, uh, did a lot of uh, uh, small jobs as clerking and things like that. But he worked his way up and became the clerk of the Sixth Division Court in town, which is uh, uh, in Simcoe County, which was a very prestigious position. Um, another person who was there is Thomas Williams, another fascinating character. Um, his father had settled one of the first farms north of Barrie in 1821. It was in Craighurst, north of, just north of Craighurst. Um, Thomas was the, the eldest son. He went on to become a Methodist um, minister, and he spent the next 50 years uh, ministering to all over North Simcoe County, um, wedding services, funeral services, and, and Sunday morning church services and, and the like. But he was remarkable in that he was present for a lot of the big events and got to know a lot of the prominent people all over Simcoe County during those pioneer years. And in uh, 1892, um, he started writing down his reminiscences. Um, they would, his, his writings were serialized in the Aurelia Packet over four papers. And um, they were finally published in a journal called the Pioneer Papers that you can get in the Aurelia Library. Um, he's, he was a historian for the pioneers. And the other person I just want to mention is Elizabeth Bowers. Um, her husband was one of the first white settlers in the town site of Aurelia. He's one of the settlers who made life miserable for the Chippewa and, and uh, um, encouraged them to leave. But uh, her husband was a carpenter in town here. Um, but Elizabeth Bowers was 84 years old at the time of this parade and insisted on being there. Um, she was um, very diabetic. And she was very ill at this point, but she insisted on being in the parade. So you can imagine her in the, the cold drizzle in her carriage, bundled up in blankets. But she was there for the, the whole day out in that rain. She died nine days later. They didn't say what she died of, but it was certainly something diabetes related. But she is just um, an example of how determined the pioneers were be there to accept the acknowledgement for, for the, the determination of fortitude they had had. After the pioneers had marched by, the whole parade uh, changed its persona. And this is what's really interesting to me. After the pioneers marched by, then came the entries from the industrialists and the uh, mercantilists on the main street. It started with William Tuttle. So remember, William Tuttle was that young boy whose parents had died, um, who got sent off to, to become a blacksmith was successful enough in 1877 to build a huge carriage factory in Aurelia, which I have a picture of here. Um, he's, his factory was and business was growing and growing and growing. He had taken on his son, James, J.B. Tudope, um, as his uh, partner in this endeavor. And J.B. Tudope um, became the most prominent man in Aurelia for the next half century. Um, <laughs> The Tudopes entered three wagons in the parade, and they were the next things that marched along. And what they provided was a, 
examples of how wagons were built in their factories. Most of the townspeople knew there was this big building down there, but didn't really see what was going on to it. Go on the side, they just saw their wagons came out the other end. So on, on the first big, enormous flat that he had, there, there was a blacksmith from their factory with an anvil pounding red hot iron that he pulled out of a forge right on the, right on the wagon, showing how the hardware for the wagons were made. Beside him was a, a partially built wagon with two more factory men showing how the woodworking was done and how the construction was done of the wagons. And then there were two more partially completed wagons behind that with more men showing the cushioning and the upholstering and the finishing um, and how the, the finishing touches were put on a wagon. It was, it was like a, the, a demonstration of their whole factory on one big flatbed uh, wagon. Behind that, a second wagon came with examples of all the finished products they made from, from wagons to carriages to cutters to sleds and all the things they made. And then behind that was the third one was uh, a wagon probably like the one you see pictured here um, with J.B. Tutto, the 27-year-old uh, partner in, in the factory, uh, being pulled by a magnificent pair of horses, accepting the accolades of the crowd. Now, what you have to understand is not only was this a celebration of their success as businessmen, it was a celebration of their idea to achieve success. It was, it was, an, it was a celebration of the vision and the, uh, the big thinking that these men had, that they, in a town of 3,000 people on the frontier, you know, a half a day's train ride away from Toronto, that they could build a factory like this and produce these state-of-the-art uh, uh, wagons. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was an audacious thing to do. Um, and this is really what was being celebrated, not just their success, but the audaciousness of their big thinking. Um, that audaciousness, that, those big ideas, it turns out that that was what became known as the Aurelia spirit down the road. And this is what we're going to talk about here. Um, the uh, parades up to this point um, in a small town like Aurelia would normally consist of um, uh, a, a brass band, a bunch of men carrying banners with messages on them and some wagons with celebrities in it. This display of, of a story of, of how a wagon was made was a completely new idea. They're, they had never seen a float in Aurelia before. And the idea came from Toronto Semi-Centennial Parade. So uh, Bertram and Scatting, when they were down there, they were really impressed with this. And they obviously brought the idea back and approached all the mercantilists and said, look, why don't you show us what you do? Why don't you make a display? Why don't we... Why don't we celebrate uh, um, the idea of what you're doing? And this reminded me of uh, Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s and his famous, famous line, the medium is the message. The float is the message. The idea that you can do this brand new way of d display was a really remarkable new thing. It was a, it was a big idea in itself. And um, um that's a whole piece of the puzzle in, in what the Aurelia spirit was. People didn't really know what a remarkable town Aurelia was. They were so busy working hard to, to move Aurelia forward. They hadn't stopped to think about that, what a remarkable place it was. And it was this parade, this parade of floats, this, this demonstration of big ideas was, was suddenly creating this realization that, holy cow, this is a pretty neat town we're living in here. There were 12 of these floats. So Tudop set the stage with, with his remarkable display. And following behind him was the other big manufacturer in town, Robert Brammer. Brammer was another early back blacksmith who now was running a foundry, uh, crafting metal into all kinds of things. And he had two enormous wagons with two of his finished products on display. Again, People didn't know what went on in that factory. They just knew it was sooty and smelly and made a lot of noise. And they took big boxes onto the train every so often. But he was displaying two of the things he made. And not only were they big contraptions that he made, but they were machines that Robert Brammer had designed himself 
had produced every component part of himself in his factory and assembled and then marketed all across Canada. The first was a shingling machine. The standard shingles used on housing back then were all cedar shakes, and we were lots of cedar around here. Um, there were there were sawmill machines where you could shave off these cedar shakes, um, and they needed them by the tens of thousands. Robert Brammer designed a new and improved one. Um, it was the best one on the market, um, and he put it on display on on uh, on this flatbed. It had a circular saw that was five feet five feet wide. The blade was five feet tall. The circular saw. It was. Uh, it had uh, a, a, a track where a cedar log could be slid past it to shave off shingles. Um, he could produce with his shingling machine thirty thousand shingles in a day. It was a, re a remarkable improvement over the technology that was out there from other factories. Um, it was probably at that time, it was still driven by uh, a steam driven engine. Um, by 1895, they would have uh, um, a, a central drive belt that drew that would drive a lot of those um, inside a factory. But back then it was probably steam engine. But it was again, it was their, the townspeople's first look at this great big machine that not only was produced in Aurelia, it was designed and every component built in Aurelia by this remarkable man, Robert Brammer. The second wagon he had had uh, one of his pumping machines. It was a steam driven pump designed for the oil industry and the mining industry. So uh, in Sarnia, they had just started pumping the first oil in Canada and these pumps were there to pump the oil, but they were also used in mines to pump water out of the bottom of mines. But again, it had a steam uh, boiler the size of a small locomotive attached to this enormous pump with with you know big foot thick pipes attached to it all designed produced constructed and shipped out of Aurelia a little town of 3,000 people on the edge of the wilderness it was a remarkable um, display of, of success in Aurelia then came all the mercantilists and and uh, there was just some a few interesting things in here. G.G. Wilson had uh, the farm equipment, about half of it he produced in his own factory, half he brought in and sold, but all the, the reapers and mowers and, and those kinds of things. George Vick, who had, had been the, the first baker in Aurelia in 1853, um, was successful and he reinvested in himself and started a general store and it was successful. So he reinvested in himself and he built an enormous three-story um, roller mill on the waterfront down beside what became Kuchiting Park. Um, he had three wagons in there, one showing all the baked goods he made in his bakery and then display of what he had for sale at the um, in his uh, grocery store. But then he had the display of all the different kind of grains and seeds and everything that he could produce uh, in his mill. And it was, it was a celebration of success, but it was a celebration of the idea that you re reinvest in yourself and it's, it's, you don't sit on your money, you make your money work for you um, and act on your vision. T.B. Mitchell had an interesting thing on his wagon um, he had a furniture store and he had uh, examples of all the furniture he built, but he also constructed in his factory um, a gi gigantic rocking chair. They didn't say how big it was, but it was probably eight or 10 feet tall, this gigantic rocking chair uh, um, as a, a sign of the success of his business. Um, it, it was a lot like J.H. Uh, Wilson who came along. He had a, a, a big grocery store called Our House was the name of his store. And so what did he do? He constructed a miniature house and put it on the front of his wagon and then had all of the groceries behind it. And it was it was a new idea. They had never seen anything like these floats um, in parades in Aurelia before. My favorite one, though, has to be J.J. Hatley, the butcher. He pulled his wagon up and he had two sloping walls like the like the peak of a roof. And with shelves on on the sides of the, the sloping walls displaying every kind of meat he sold. Sides of beef and and uh, pork and chicken and sausages and venison and moose and you name it. Just this wall of meat on each side up going up and down the main street. And you have to imagine like this is back in the days when there's no refrigeration and they traipse this meat all through town all day. You can bet darn well he was selling that meat in a store the next day. <laughs> I don't know if we would buy it today, but I just this wall of meat going by who no one would have dreamt anyone would do that. 
before this parade. This was just a new idea of, of this kind of display. So after these 12, 12 floats went by, came the, the more typical things in a parade, the Agricultural Society um, with the Peter Burton and Scatting, the president and the, and the secretary um, marching along, the, the Simcoe Foresters militia marked, marched along in their full regalia, their bright red British coats, the fire company in their uniforms marched, the uh, Mechanics Institute, which is the library, that's what they called themselves back then. They, they were the typical ones with banners, with, with uh, slogans promoting uh, literacy and worldliness. Uh, the, the lacrosse team marched by, and then the fraternal group, the Sons of England marched by. And behind them come, comes the future. 600 school children, had to be every kid in town, um, organized by their teachers in little platoons. And the newspaper said that was the highlight of the whole parade, seeing the children march by. So, holy cow, we had gone from a celebration of the pioneers and their, their determination and fortitude to all of a sudden this celebration of big ideas and success in, in, in a way that had never been seen before. Well, the whole parade... Uh, marched along up to uh, the Market Square, which is where the Opera House is now. So this is 10 years before the Opera House. It was long before the library. It was a big open square at the corner of West Street in Mississauga. Um, the whole parade, a thousand people congregated there. And then the 5,000 people from around town all congregated there. So they must have been flowing out and filling in the whole, the, the whole street. Um, um, for the uh, reception that went on. Now, by, by now, the rain had stopped. It was just sort of misty again, but it was getting late in the afternoon. It was probably 5.30 in the afternoon on October 2nd. The sun was probably getting low in the sky. Uh, and sure enough, there was a politician who was gonna get up and, and, and give the big speech. And the politician they chose was Herman Cook, who had been the member of parliament for, this, for East Simcoe. Um, but he lost the last election to uh, the conservative Dalton McCarthy. And, and if you know your history, Dalton McCarthy is a really interesting character. <laughs> um, but Dalton McCarthy had more important things to do. He had brought um, 11 of his livestock up to the, um, um, the Agricultural Society Fair that was going on that night and the next day. Um, and he had the his prize bull, the 2,500 pound Sir Lewis, and his 10 prize cows up to 1,500 pounds each. And he was up at the agricultural grounds, making sure they were housed properly, everything. So that politician didn't want to speak. So they took the previous one, Herman Cook. And Herman Cook, the liberal, um, he's wisely, because it was late in the day, he only spoke for about 15 minutes, but he, um, he started by talking about the pioneers, and the difficulties they had had and, and how they had to be admired and congratulated for their success and, and, and uh, going on like that. But then he started talking about the success that those pioneers bred um, brought more success as the town became uh, uh, with a stronger economy and expanding. Um, and he got more and more excited as he was going, talking about the, the uh, enormous uh, potential and the opportunity you could have in Aurelia if you were a businessman. And he, he ended his talk, and this line just jumps out at me. Um, there's Herman Cook right there. That uh, um, you can almost hear him rising in fervor and pounding his fist on the desk that Aurelia, we are prepared to compete with our, our neighbors in everything. And if that's not a statement of the Aurelia spirit, I don't know what is. There's nothing that you can do that we can't do, and we'll probably do it better than you. It's a big idea. It's a vision. It's an audacity. Um, it was the first sort of public expression collectively of what the Aurelia spirit was. He was followed by two of the pioneers, uh, James Quinn, who had been the reeve of the township forever, um, and who spoke and told some anecdotes about, about pioneer days. And then Thomas Williams, that minister who had spent 50 years ministering around North Simcoe, he got up and, and told some, some anecdotes of, of pioneer life. Then the Simcoe Foresters stepped up, the, the, the uh, militia unit you see here, um, and they fired off two volleys with their, with their rifles. Um, and after the whole, the whole session was over, um, uh, I'm not sure where they did this, but they uh, put on a, a couple of demonstration of skirmishes, um, which were always popular. 
and that was it for for that part of the day. By then, the sun was setting. Um, it would, people were probably soaked to the bone and happy to go home and get some dinner and dry off. But then so many of the people arrived back downtown because every business up and down the main street, every single business that said in the paper had decorated itself in British flags and bunting and, and, uh, uh, and magic lanterns. Um, this was before there were street lights. So they had all these lanterns lighting up and they had a social up and down the main street. Um, and then the next day was the big agricultural fair. So the 5,000 people who came to town found a way to stay over overnight in town. And then they all enjoyed the, the biggest fair really that it ever had the next day. So it was quite a day. This was the, the semi-centennial celebration. It had gone from a celebration of the pioneers to this full-on celebration of the Aurelia spirit. It was, it was the first public consciousness that Aurelia was a special place, that Aurelia was doing things that no other town was doing in the way they were doing it. And, and it was the next generation who carried on in that tradition. So I just want to go through um, a few select people here who were filled with the Aurelia spirit and did big things. So first up is J.P. Secord. His big idea came just uh, five years after the semi-centennial parade. He had the idea that um, Aurelia could have a Medicare program. There was no hospital in Aurelia. So he approached six of the leading businessmen, in, including J.B. Tidope, who agreed to invest in his big idea. And so with that money, he he built the uh, Aurelia Red Cross Hospital out on Orchard Point, the first hospital in Aurelia. But his idea was Medicare. For $5, you could get free healthcare for a year. And he sent men out to all the lumber camps um, all around the area, selling these, uh, these uh, memberships in his hospital to the men on payday, of course, and uh, raised enough money to operate his hospital for a year. And he was able to keep this going for three or four years before, before uh, the cost caught up with them. It was an idea ahead of its time, but it was a big idea. It had never been done in Canada before. It was the first Medicare program in Canada. A, a, a local entrepreneur came up with the idea. Harold Hale, if there isn't a better representative of the Aurelia spirit, I don't know, don't know who he'd be. Harold Hale was Mr. Aurelia. He was the owner of the Aurelia Packet um, newspaper. He was the editor there for about 65 years. If there was a big program going on, he was a part of it. But he was the originator of a whole host of big ideas. One was, it was his idea to build the Champlain Monument. And it was at a low ebb of French-English relations in Canada. And he thought we should build a monument to a Frenchman in the heart of English Ontario. Um, as a as a, like a handshake out to, to Quebec. It was his idea that we should form the Aurelia Water, Light and Power Commission, a public commission separate from town council to uh, act as a utility to uh, govern our electricity and water. When the OWLP was started, I'm, I can't even remember where, around 1910, um, it was the only competition to Ontario, Ontario Hydro anywhere in the province. Ontario Hydro was, was uh, producing electricity from Niagara Falls and driving Hamilton and Toronto and all their industries there. But they had expanded and they were, they were scooping up um, any power, uh, uh, power dam anywhere across Ontario except Aurelia. Aurelia built their own dam and built their own power lines and we had our own power commission we were one of the only two power commissions in Ontario. That was Harold Hale's idea. It was Harold Hale's idea that when the new hospital was built, um, starting the, the idea started in 1915, um, the new hospital, that it should be Soldiers Memorial Hospital, meaning any veteran of World War I returning to Aurelia should receive free um, health care for the rest of their lives in our hospital. To do that, he had to convince Aurelia's 15 doctors to waive their fees um, for those soldiers. And he did it. He talked the doctors into giving a thousand men free health care for the rest of their lives. The pretty tall order, but it was a big idea. It was Harold Hale who, who uh, was the idea man behind the Steve Leacock home. Um, there are other men who made it happen, but it was his idea that the, after Leacock died and his cottage became derelict, that it should be restored and turned into a museum, and we still have it today. It was Harold Hale's idea 
uh, to create the Canadian Club in 1906 or 1907. Um, it was a forum to bring prominent Canadian speakers to Aurelia to uh, to bring ideas to town, uh, prominent speakers, um, and and um, that club carried on for half a century. So Harold Hale was an was an ideas man. So it was W. S. Frost. He had been mayor of Aurelia, but uh, um, he was the, the driving force behind the building of the YMCA in Aurelia that. For 50 years, in the National YMCA Training Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, there was a picture of the Aurelia Y hanging on the wall in the lobby with the caption, find a small town YMCA in North America. It was W.S. Frost who insisted that we don't just build a Y, we build the best Y around. And for 50 years, we had the best small town Y um, anywhere in Canada, probably in North America, and it's it thanks to Frost. Um, W.S. Frost was the, the idea man that Aurelia's waterfront, which had been given over to industrial interests, to the, to the railways and the lumber industry, it was his idea that it should be, be returned to the public through public parks. And uh, the waterfront we have today is primarily his vision that, that created that. And his other claim to fame, he was known as Daylight Bill because in 1912, he, he talked town council into declaring daylight savings time so that Aurelia um, was going to have a more efficient uh, work day with daylight savings. Unfortunately, we were the only town that did it. So for the six weeks it ran, we were on a different time than everybody else. But it was an idea ahead of its time because three years later in 1916, all of Canada adopted daylight savings time as a, a wartime efficiency. We just did it three years before everybody else. Thomas Shepard, another idea man, he came up with the idea that Aurelia could build its own power dam and long distance power lines to bring that, that hydro energy from the Severn River 25 kilometers down to Aurelia to drive our factories and, and, and drive our economy. Um, it was his idea and he was so committed to it that he ran for mayor and he served two terms of mayor to make sure that dam got built. And in 1902, Aurelia's power dam opened, and uh, we had our 25-kilometer hydro lines owned by the municipality, run by the OWLP commission, um, and we didn't rely on Ontario Hydro at all. We, for, for half a century, we had the cheapest power rates in Ontario, um, and it brought a lot of industry to town. But that was Thomas Shepard. Erastus Long was the son-in-law of uh, Robert Brammer. Remember the man with the, uh, the, the big uh, shingle mill in the parade. Um, when Robert Brammer died, Erastus Long took over. And he took over a successful foundry, but he brought new ideas to it. He started designing and producing in the same way Brammer did, um, heavy, heavy machinery that was shipped all across Canada. By 1910, it was said that every single mine in Canada was using um, heavy equipment from Long's factory in Aurelia. He was, Rastus Long was uh, one of those, the men who invested in other people's ideas and was a supporter of progress in Aurelia. He was, he was on, the, um, on the, the ball for any, any big project that was going on that was moving the town forward. But he, he created this, this uh, enormous factory in town himself. It's gotta be my favorite person here is Harriet Todd. You've all heard of Harriet Todd School in Aurelia, uh, a public school. Nobody knows who she is. Um, and a couple of years ago, I, I, I was looking into who she was, and I was flabbergasted at what this woman did. She was just a remarkable one. She was fighting after, after 1900 um, for any cause that was going to improve women's lives. Uh, she started... Um, by joining the Women's Institute. And within two years, she was president of the East Simcoe Women's Institute. The Women's Institute was a, was a fraternal group um, dedicated to improving the lives of rural women. So in that capacity, she was fighting for public health, um, better education, um, uh, adult education for these women, um, a number of programs to, uh, to support rural women. A lot, of, a lot of them were struggling under a lot of hardship. And she was out there fighting for rural women. So she was president of the East Simcoe um, Women's Institute. But 
she very quickly started organizing all the women's institutes across Ontario and formed the Ontario Association of Women's Institutes and became its first president. She didn't stop there. So then she thought, well, it works for Ontario. Why aren't we doing this across Canada? And she started uh, lobbying to create the Canadian Association of Women's Institutes and became its second president. But she was the driving force in getting it created. And not stopping there, in the late 1920s, when her health was failing, she was a driving force between the creation of the British Empire Association of Women's Institutes. Um, she was not well enough to do it herself, but she was directing um, her delegates to communicate to with women's institutes in in Britain, in South Africa, in Australia, in New Zealand, and brought them all together. It, it didn't happen until after she died, but she was the driving force behind it. She was just a remarkable woman. She was the first woman elected to any post in Aurelia when she was elected to the uh, Simcoe County School Board, or sorry, the Aurelia School Board in in 1919, and she served on the on the school board um, without break, passionately um, until her death in 1933. She was just a remarkable woman. There's way more that she did beyond that. John Miller is one of my favorite guys in Aurelia. He was like Erastus Long. He was on board with any any big idea that was going on. He was just a progressive supporter of Aurelia. His big idea, though, is is fun, that he's responsible for organing, organizing the first round-the-world tour by any sports team in any sport from anywhere in the world. And this was in 1907 when he took the, the Aurelia Terriers Lacrosse Club to Australia to play a series of games. The Australians have been trying to get a Canadian club to come down um, for uh, almost 15 years, and no one would do it because it was way too expensive, way too expensive. John Miller came up with the idea that, what's the problem? The tour will pay for itself. We'll just play a series of games, and the gate, sh the gate revenue will pay for the trip. And the Australians wanted nothing to do with that. And he, he hounded and hounded them and convinced them that when the Canadian team shows up, you're going to get unprecedented crowds. It's going to pay for itself. Finally, he talked them into it. So he took the Aurelia team with, with the supplemented by some, some other men across Ontario, and they played a series of nine games um, across Canada on their way to Vancouver. Um, and the gate receipts from that paid for that trip. Once they got to Vancouver and got on board ship, the Australians were paying for it, hoping that the gate receipts were going to pay for it. Well, when they got to Australia, they were a sensation. Instead of drawing a few hundred people to their games, they were drawing 10,000 people to see these games because people wanted to see the, the great Canadian lacrosse team. And uh, they they played a series of 15 games. And not only did it pay for their trip, it uh, they doubled the amount of money they needed, and that was all profit for the Australian Lacrosse Associations. So John Miller was a big idea guy. And if you read my little book about that around the world, or around the world lacrosse tour, they played four games against the Australian all-star team that was every bit as dramatic as the Canada-Russia hockey series in 1972. And I won't ruin it for you, but you have to read that book if you want to see it. A lot of you will heard of Skid Watson. Skid Watson was the director of the Aurelia YMCA for 41 years. Um, his big idea was social service and, and what a role it could play in Aurelia. And he thought that Improving society started with children, and he in 19, well, he was one of the first campers in 1910 at the YMCA Wilderness Camp across uh, across the lake at Camp Summerland. He was one of the first campers there, but when he took over, he dedicated his, his life to developing that camp, so starting in 1928, and uh, thousands and thousands of, of Aurelia children would spend four weeks um, living in the wilderness, learning um, uh, cooperation and democracy at his camp. Um, he founded the Aurelia Wiseman's Club to support that program at the camp. And it was it was the, the second for, uh, a social, um, social club in Aurelia, a service club in Aurelia. Uh, the Kiwanis Club started, I think, the year before, and Skid was a part of that too. But it, the Wiseman's was the most effective service club in Aurelia for half a century. There's, there's remarkable stories and things that they accomplished. Um, but Skid was Skid was a big idea guy. Uh, some of you will know who Mark Plunkett is. Again, what, what, what a thing he did. 
he was a YMCA captain supporting the morale of the men in World War I. Um, with a, with canteens and education services and sports and, and all kinds of things. But he started the Dumbbells, which was a vaudeville troupe manned by soldiers from, from the Canadian Army um, who right at the front on packing box stages um, put on shows to improve the morale of the men. This had never been done before. It was audacious. Um, it was incredibly successful so that by the end of the war, um, he had 19 different shows um, traveling along the front, entertaining the men, and the Americans and the British and the and it was the Italians, or, oh, probably the French, were also starting to stage shows in the way that Mert Plunkett taught them how. He traveled around and he taught um, different groups how to put these shows on. It was a tremendous success. And he was a young man who grew up in the Aurelia YMCA. Franklin Carmichael, I hope you all recognize that name if you're at the Aurelia Museum of Art and History. He was one of the members of the group of seven that revolutionized Canadian art and created a persona for Canadian art worldwide. You don't need to say more than that. And I bet hardly any of you know who B.F. Stewart is. He's one of my favorites. In 1895, William Röntgen discovered x-rays in Germany. Five weeks late, five weeks later, B.F. Stewart, a photographer in the frontier town of Aurelia in, in 1895, went out and bought an x-ray machine five weeks after x-rays had been discovered. And he was using it for artistic photography, but it didn't take long for the medical doctors to realize what a useful tool this was. And they started sending patients to his photography studio to get x-rayed. And in those days, to get an x-ray, you had to have full anesthetic because it was a five the five minute exposure. Um, he was the only provider of x-rays in Aurelia until 1964 for 70 years. In 1910, he, he was finally persuaded, or in 1912, he was finally persuaded by the doctors to move his x-ray machine to the Aurelia hospital. Um, might've been 1920, I forget now. Anyway, and he moved the, his machine to the hospital. He owned it on the stipulation that he would personally take all the x-rays. And so he became the x-ray tech at the hospital um, until he died. And when he died, his sons carried on and his sons took all the x-rays at the Aurelia Hospital until 1964. It's it pretty remarkable. This this was a guy with a, who was daring, who, who would take big risks and had a big idea that really worked well. Um, Walter Knox, we know him, if you've read my book, um, you'll know him as the world champion track and field athlete, um, and he led a remarkable life. But what his big idea was, um, was to bring fitness and athletic to the athletics um, to the Ontario school curriculum. So in 1920, there was no athletics in the Ontario school curriculum. In 1930, it was a core part of the curriculum. And in the meantime, in that decade of the 1920s, Walter Knox toured uh, toured schools all across Ontario, four months a year, putting on track and field clinics, starting uh, competitions, uh, creating a, an Ontario School Boys Track and Field Championship. Um, when that had succeeded by 1925, by the end of the 1920s, he um, raised enough money through the Ontario Athletic Commission to build the Ontario Athletic Commission camp and he built it across the lake uh, in, from Aurelia, where he built the best track in Ontario, state-of-the-art cinder track, and a first-class summer camp where the top schoolboy athletes in Ontario um, could spend three weeks under the guidance of the Olympic coach, which was Walter Knox. He, is, he was twice Canada's Olympic coach. And his whole goal was to do develop athletes for the Olympics. In 1920 and 1924, or Canada's track and field team was not even close to winning a medal other than one guy who was an American. After uh, six years, seven years of running his, his uh, clinics around Ontario, um, those young boys from, from public school age had, had grown up to become good enough athletes to make the Canadian Olympic team. And in 1928 Olympics, Canada won, I, I forget, it was about six medals in, in men's athletics and another four in women's athletics the first time the women's were there. Um, in 1932, they won four more. In 1936, they won four more. Then his program ended in 1942 because of the war. 
And after the war, athletic training was handing over to high school teachers. For the next six Olympics, Canada won a total of one medal in track and field. His program, his big idea of developing schoolboy athletics and getting athletics as part of the curriculum in Ontario public schools, paid enormous dividends when it came to Olympic gold medals. These are just 12 examples of, of people who had the Aurelia spirit, who had vision, um, who were not afraid to act on that vision, and who found a way to, to uh, be successful that way. It was the Aurelia spirit. Thank you, Dave, for a very enjoyable presentation on Aurelia's early years and the bold spirit that fostered many groundbreaking schemes back in the day. You introduced us to a lot of fascinating characters, just remarkable people. So I really appreciate that. And thank you for doing that. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can um, purchase Dave's book, uh, The Aurelia Spirit is Born at the OMA shop. So you can purchase um, right at the museum or you can order online as well. And we do have a very exciting lineup uh, coming up in 2024. Um, our next speaker on February 21st is Graham Davis registered professional forester, County of Simcoe, and his talk, The Simcoe County Forest, A Century of Growth and Renewal. Graham will share the history of the Simcoe County Forest and how through a century of continued effort, the county has turned one of the most devastated landscapes into Ontario's largest community forest today. So our 2024 speakers uh, series calendar is available on the OMA's website if you want to check it out. And at some point, the pre-registration links will be available so you can book ahead. But we do have an exciting year ahead, so we're looking forward to seeing you again and joining us on February. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.